yourself right now, who is Molly Bloom, and what the heck is she doing at a blockchain conference? And that's a fair question, and so these are my answers. Number one, I'm a bit of a gambler, so I have a real appreciation for wild volatility. I've seen my net worth go from zero to hero, and back again too many times to count. Number two, I'm a big fan of a little well-intended disruption, and number three, in my line of business, I was both the bank and I issued a token. So, um, but I'm getting ahead of myself, so let me start from the beginning. I was born in Loveland, Colorado, a small town 60 miles north of Denver. I was born to two parents who cared deeply about raising compassionate and successful children. And I lived in a, you know, a, a pretty much only child bliss until my brothers were born. And these weren't any normal brothers, you guys. These were tiny, evil superhumans. <laughs> Jordan, my middle brother, came out just a genius from birth. I mean, by age five, he was beating my father in chess. He was testing out of his math class, into mine, out of mine. And uh, he went on to be a Harvard-educated cardiothoracic surgeon. My youngest brother, Jeremy, uh, was a little athlete prodigy. And he uh, is a six-time world champion, two-time Olympian, and he casually went from the Turin Olympics to the NFL Combine, where he got drafted fifth round to the Philadelphia Eagles. So this is what I was dealing with. So basically, the turnout here was that starting at my dinner table, I was neither the smartest or most talented in the room. So I had to compensate for that by being the hardest worker. I was also a dreamer, and I dreamed my life big or bigger than my brother's. And the first dream I had was to be an Olympic skier. Unfortunately, I did not have the natural talent that Jeremy had. And at age 12, I was diagnosed with scoliosis. The doctors told me that if I didn't get surgery, I would become deformed and I would slowly suffocate. They also told me I would be uh, on my back for a year, homeschooled, and that my ski career was over. Well, I couldn't imagine my way out of suffocating, but I could imagine my ski career back on the snow in a year, and that's what I did. And for the next eight years, I showed up early to training, and I left late, and I skied through pain, and I sacrificed. And at age 19, I made the US ski team. At age 20, I was third in North America. And at 21, I made it all the way to the Olympic qualifier. I was standing there. It doesn't end well. <laughs> so I'm standing at the gate, <laughs> but I appreciate it. I'm standing at the gate, and uh, the, the start, and I get on, I get on course, and I feel great. I'm skiing the best I've ever skied, and um, the visibility was low that day. And what the race officials do when the visibility is low is they put little tiny pieces of pine bough on the course to show depth perception. And I skied right before the bottom air, perfectly over this little piece of stick and it lodged itself perfectly in between my bindings and my skis, and my ski pre-released 20 feet in the air, and I fell head first in my digitally remastered spine. I'll never forget the terrible sound it made and the excruciating pain, and when I came to, the doctors told me that if I continued like this, I would become paralyzed. So my ski career was over that day, not because I didn't train hard enough, not because I wasn't prepared, because I tripped on a stick. So I tried to finish school. I was in my last year of, of, of undergrad and headed to law school. But my heart was just broken. I looked out at those mountains every day. I went to the University of Colorado and I could see the mountains and just needed to get out of town. And I wanted to be young and free and just be a kid for a little while before law school. So I decided to go to LA. And my family didn't support this little uh, break from reality. So I had to get a job immediately. And I got a job at the first place that would hire me, and it was a fine dining restaurant in Los Angeles. Now, I'd saved a little bit on the resume, uh, on the application, because I didn't know the first thing about fine dining. And so it kind of came as no surprise when the boss called me in and said, we're firing you because you're the worst waitress we've ever seen. But you show up early, you leave late, and you work hard. And so I'm offering you a job as my personal assistant. This guy was super demanding, a little psychotic. And, uh, but I said yes, because I wasn't in a position to negotiate. 
So I started working for him and it was demeaning at times and demanding and he came into the office one day and said some words that sound pretty innocuous at the time but would change my life forever. He said, I need you to serve drinks at my poker game. And I'm thinking, okay, you know, do you guys play poker? Anyone in the audience? I went home that night and I googled what kind of music do poker players like to listen to and what do they eat? And so I made this embarrassing playlist with songs like The Gambler on it. And I bought a supermarket cheese plate and I showed up. And I'm expecting, you know, the overgrown frat boys that my boss usually hangs out with. So imagine my surprise when people like Leonardo DiCaprio, Ben Affleck, the heads of the biggest studios, heads of banks, started walking through the door. And I had this realization that a 22-year-old kid from a small town in Colorado doesn't get an opportunity to network with these types of people every day. And then at the end of the night, I made $3,000, so I was in. So I went home and I, uh, I taught myself, I started learning about poker. I became fluent in the language. I learned the rules and the objectives of the game. And then I studied the customer. I studied the player. I wanted to know why why these people, with all their access to anyone and anything in the world, why they wanted to come to this dingy basement and play poker every week with my cheap supermarket cheese plate and red solo cups. And what I landed on was these guys had all the things that they wanted. They wanted experiences. They wanted to come into this room and be somewhere and someone else for a night. And so I started to build on that. And I built on that through conferring value, through re remembering what people like to drink and eat, uh, forging alliances, and people took note, and so did my boss. And he said one day, um, I need the list of the players and the accounting you've been keeping because you're done. And it had been eight months, I had made a lot of money, and I could see how to turn this into a business. Um, so I couldn't go back. I couldn't go back to being an errand girl, to being demeaned. But going up against him meant going up against someone very rich, someone very powerful, someone who worshipped at the altar of Machiavelli and believed in destroying their enemies. And I'm a 22-year-old kid. It also meant asking the Billionaire Boys Club to forego one of their own and trust me with their game and their money. But as Wayne Gretzky says, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. So I knew I had to take it. So I organized a game the following week without him. I invited all the players. I moved it into the presidential suite at the Four Seasons, and I told everyone that I was going to run my own game, and they were welcome to come if they wanted. And they did. And now I was the owner and operator of the game. And I was able to pull in all the things that I thought I could do to make this a better business. Number one, I raised the stakes from ten to 50000 because economics matter particularly when it comes to experience and escapism. Number two, I hired a full staff of beautiful people to serve drinks, to memorize everyone's preferences, because never underestimate the value of people being seen, heard, and remembered. Number three, I needed new players. I needed customers. Um, and so I came here to Vegas, and I made a deal with the casino host. I said, look, I've got some of the biggest gamblers in the world. I'll guarantee you X amount of trips. I'll bring them in here, they'll play but I need names and numbers of the biggest poker players in the area. And it worked. I had a full game and a waiting list. And I was the owner and the operator and the CEO of one of the biggest poker games in the country. But I had a silent partner. And this guy was a really big, famous celebrity. You've all seen him in movies, but what, you would, what would shock you is how obsessed he was with playing at this game. He was out for blood. He didn't even care so much about playing as he did about taking people's money or crushing their souls, as he called it. <laughs> and that was all fine, but he didn't want a fair fight. He played dirty, he played unfair, and he started cheating with another player. And I had to put my foot down. And it culminated with a very weird standoff. He came up to me at the end of the night and said, here's your chip, here's a thousand dollar chip but I need you to get on the table and bark like a seal. And I'm like, what? <laughs> but he was serious. And 30 minutes later, with my face beat red, and all the players had stopped playing poker and was watching this, this demand, 
And I knew this wasn't about barking and $1,000. This was a demand for compliance and submission. And I couldn't do that. And I knew it would cost me the game. And it did. He leveraged his star power and took everything from me. And overnight, like tripping on a stick, I had lost everything. I was terrified of going back to being a no one. I was heartbroken, but I was pissed. And I said to myself, I'm not going away quietly. And even more than that, I'm going to go bigger. And this time I'm building an empire that nobody can take. And so I thought the best place to do that was New York City. Yeah. Got some New Yorkers in the house. <laughs> so I took exploratory trips, but it was 2008. And Wall Street and the economy was facing devastation. But I didn't care. I just saw the win. And by the end of 2008, I had built a game five times bigger than my LA game, $250,000 buy-in. And this time, I wasn't going to be replaceable. This time, I was going to be the bank. I would guarantee, extend credit, pay out the game. And this game was populated by huge Wall Street titans, um, international billionaires, sports stars. I became the credit and finance arm for the biggest game in the world, and I just turned 30. Yeah. It's, a <laughs> Something changed in me in New York, though. It stopped being so much about guts and heart. It started to be about greed and power, and it was never enough. I spent every waking minute that I wasn't running a game recruiting players, taking trips to Miami, trips to Europe, going out every night with the girls and, and recruiting players. And, and by the end um, of the year, I had a game running every minute of every day and every night. And um, my exposure was enormous. The games were playing so huge, I saw someone lose $100 million in a night. Now, you might be asking yourself at this point, was everything I was doing legal? That's a very good question. And the truth is, is that up until this point, yes. I was paying my taxes, and I was doing the one thing that was keeping it legal. I wasn't taking a rake, which in layman's terms is taking a percentage of the pot. I was operating on tips alone, and that year I had covered, I had surpassed $4 million. So it was, a good, it was a good place to be, but I, um, I was getting reckless, and I was using drugs. Drugs to stay up, drugs to come down, and drugs to address the emptiness and loneliness. And I had a ton of money on the street, a ton of debt. And in one moment, I signaled my dealer like this to take a rake, and it, it would cost me everything. But don't worry, I've got a good year of bad decision making before the whole thing comes off the tracks. <laughs> Back in LA, one of my players, named Bad Brad, um, was indicted for running a Ponzi scheme. And he was very friendly and candid to the feds when he got arrested about this girl and this game and these celebrities that took his money in a poker game. And so we all uh, got sued for the money that he stole from his clients to lose in the poker game. And the result of that was a couple, was a couple of things. Number one, um, I'm, on the, I'm on the radar for the, for the feds now. Number two, I'm in the tabloids. And that's where I got the uh, nickname, I can't seem to shake the poker princess. And um, number three, uh, yeah, sorry, just two. <laughs> so it might have been all, you know, confessions of the poker princess on the West Coast, but it was about to get all Scorsese on the East Coast. Enter in the Italian mob. <laughs> I had a driver who also acted as security when I was picking up a lot of cash, which happened often. And um, I trusted him. And he said to me one day, I drive some guys in New Jersey, they're hedge fund guys, and they'd like to play in your game. I said, great, set up a meeting. These guys walked in to the bar, and it was very, very clear to me they were not hedge fund guys. <laughs> they were organized crime. And um, it was very awkward. And to break the silence, I said, um, can I get you guys a drink? And here's the one moment of levity that I had with the Italian mob. One of the guys thought about it, looked around the room and said, uh, 
all the Napa teenies. <laughs> and I'm like, that's not a tough guy drink. <laughs> anyway, they got to the business really quickly. They said, um, it's great what you've been able to build, but you need to partner with us. You need to give us a piece, and uh, we need, you know, we're partners now. I politely declined their offer. I paid for their apple teenies, and I left. And um, then I just started uh, evading their phone calls. I just was ignoring them. And I was super distracted because I had just recruited some whales. And whales, in gambling speak, are players that give a lot of action that have a lot of money and they want to play often. These were Russians from Brighton Beach, but their story checked out. They were well-dressed, well-educated, and these guys were playing huge. And um, I just kept avoiding the calls of, of the Italians and around Christmas time in 2010, a guy knocked on my door and I thought it was my doorman. And he pushed his way in and put a gun in my mouth and he beat the hell out of me, and he robbed me. And before he left, he said, the partnership isn't optional. And if you tell anyone, we're going to Colorado to see your family. I'm going to Colorado to see your family. So <clears throat> I stayed inside for three weeks. I let my face heal. I didn't tell anyone. And in January, the headline on the New York Times said, 125 people were arrested in the biggest mob-related takedown in New York City history and I never heard from them again. But it's still coming off the tracks. And uh, my Russian friends, turns out, were much better at impersonating legitimacy than the Italians. Because they were running a $100 million insurance fraud scheme, and they had deep ties to the Russian mob. And they were on the, uh, the, the feds were tapping their phones, which means the feds were tapping my phones, so now let me just paint a little picture for you. On the West Coast, we've got a Ponzi scheme. We've got celebrities behaving badly, playing in this illegal poker game. On the East Coast, we've got the Italian mob, the Russian mob, Wall Street titans playing in this illegal game, and it's all connected by one girl in way over her head. So I bet you can guess who enters next. The feds. So I get a, I get a tip off. Uh, my, one of my poker dealers called me and said, the feds are, the FBI is here looking for you, you need to go, you need to leave town. So I grabbed my suitcase, my net worth in cash, and uh, went, got in my car and headed to the airport. I tried to book a plane flight and my credit cards declined. And I come to realize that all my assets, all my cards, everything is seized. In a matter of seconds, my net worth went from millions to zero. So all the cars, the penthouses, the games, the friends, the parties, it's all gone. I moved back home with my mom. She lives in the wilderness of Colorado. And I stayed in bed for a good three weeks, feeling sorry for myself. And finally my mom dragged me outside because I swear to God, moms think that fresh air will cure everything. <laughs> but she was kind of right. Because I stood out there and I looked at those mountains and, you know, those mountains that had raised me, and something woke up inside of me, and I decided I wasn't going to quit, and I wasn't going to fail. So I took kind of a humorous look at uh, what was left of my life to see if there was any assets. And there wasn't much, but I felt like there was a story. And I felt like if I could tell the story in the right way, maybe that was my way out. So I went to New York Publishers, and I tried to get a book deal. But all they wanted was a celebrity takedown piece. They wanted a book that was just going to gossip about the celebrities. And I thought that there was a better story than that. But I found a publisher that signed on, and I got a modest book proposal. And I wrote the book. It took me about a year and a half. And when I finished, I took what was left of my proposal, and I sold some jewelry, and I moved to, to Hollywood to pitch to Hollywood. Well, 10 days later, I got a call in the middle of the night. The voice on the other end of the line said, this is Mike so-and-so from the FBI. You need to come out of your house right now, or we're breaking down the door. I'm like, there's some mistake. I haven't run a poker game for two years. Anyway, I went into the hallway, and I was blinded by all the bright lights. 
but when my eyes adjusted, I saw 17 FBI agents with semi-automatic weapons. They arrested me, they put me in handcuffs, and they said, you need to read this piece of paper. And it said, the United States of America versus Molly Bloom. That was a bad day. So, turns out, the government wanted what the tabloids wanted, what the book publishers wanted. They wanted dirt. They wanted my information. They wanted me to be a confidential informant. And if I did that, they would give my money back, and they would give me immunity. But I knew I couldn't do that. I had built these games. I had profited from these people. And I had to stand for my choices. And it was me, in the end, who decided to break the law. I mean, this was all because of me. So I passed on the deal. I was looking at 10 years. And I went to federal court. And uh, I got a really nice judge. And that judge said, I don't see how justice is served by putting Molly Bloom in jail. Yeah. Woo. <laughs> So I'm sitting at dinner with my family and everyone's celebrating, you know, that I'm not in jail. And I'm like, I'm 33 years old. I'm a convicted felon. I'm millions of dollars in debt. And my reputation is destroyed. How do I get out of this? And I just said, you know, the story. And so I went to Hollywood and I wanted Aaron Sorkin. I'd run numbers on screenwriters. I wanted to see who delivered you know, whose batting average was good. And, and Aaron Sorkin had great odds. And he was also my favorite writer. And so I just went around to Hollywood asking everyone if I could get a meeting with him. And most people laughed at me and said, Sorkin's not gonna wanna write the, the Diary of the Poker Princess. And everyone said, there's so many powerful people that don't want this to get made, you have no shot. But man, survival mode, you know? You're like, I got nothing to lose. So I just kept going. And I got a meeting with him. And I, uh, I flew to LA and I sat down with him and for an hour I told him my story. And he kind of leaned back in his chair and looked at me and said, wow, I've never met someone so down on their luck and so full of themselves. <laughs> <laughs> and he wrote it. And three and a half years ago I was getting sentenced in federal court and this year I went to the Oscars. <laughs> because your reinvention is there anytime you want it, truly. So what does this mean and what does it matter? With a little time and perspective, what I've realized is that for all my ambition and all my striving and all my success, it was all in the service of self, and that left me pretty empty. And this time around, I want to be about something bigger than myself. I want to try to leave the world a little bit better than I left it, than I found it. And that's something that draws me to blockchain. Um, I see blockchain as a brave new world, as a move towards transparency and accountability and away from corruption and monopolies. And I think in the right hands done the right way, blockchain is really a revolution for good and for all. And that's something I still want to be a part of. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening.